In each episode of this series, I will offer an applicant a blind choice of either a pleasant experience, a treat, or a darker trick. They won't know which one they've chosen, and they may not know how or when it will happen to them. All the applicants responded to advertisements. These are the six people that I've selected. They just don't know it yet. Welcome to Trick or Treat. Tonight's applicant is Richard, a 20-year-old student from Wolverhampton. We've been observing him for the last few weeks to build up a profile and to monitor his movements to and from his flat. He lives a quiet and predictable life, which might be fun to shake up a bit. At 3 a.m. one morning in March, we've gathered outside his house, where he is hopefully asleep. His girlfriend has been persuaded to lend us a set of keys. I'm going to quietly break in and introduce myself. something nice. If you pick the one that says drink, it won't be. Okay. Okay? You won't know which one you've picked. You happy to play? Okay. You're going to sign this. For Richard's trick, I'm going to have him collapse asleep in London and wake up 1,500 miles away in Morocco with no explanation. And for that, I'll need his passport. He will have no memory of the journey or of any time having passed. More of Richard's adventure later. 
Meanwhile, I've met up with the League of Gentlemen for a discussion about fate and mini rolls. Hello. Hello there. Hi guys. Actually, would you grab a little chocolate roll from the uh, tray? From there here, then, yep. certainly. Uh, there are five there, so if you can take one each, and if somebody can just put the last one in their pocket, that would be great. And come and sit down any chair that you like. Any, any one of these four. Hello, and, how are you? Steve, pleasure, 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 pleasure. Thank you, and uh, Jeremy, nice to meet you. Have you got the last one that wasn't chosen? In your pocket, great, keep that in there for the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, well, look, thanks so much for coming out, thanks for doing this. Um, I want to show you these. Um, there's four cards, there's something on the other side, but if you just mix them up for me, don't turn them over yet. And push them in the middle, if you can all just take one each, doesn't matter at the moment which one you take, but if you can just pull one towards you. On each card there's a message. And I want you just to have a look and memorise now the message that, that you've got. Done that? Yeah. Great, lovely, and I'll have those back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Do any of you believe in fate at any level? Yes. Do I do? Yeah. yeah. I think things happen because they're meant to happen. I believe in summer fates, but no other. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that we create our own destiny. <laughs> oh, you've got to come up with a different oh, belief not, system no. now. <laughs> no, 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 genuine, genuine. I, genu well, I, don't, I don't try and do talk. comical answers to it, but I, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, yeah I, think, I agree with Steve. I think you do, you, instinct often leads to exactly where you're meant to be. You superstitious fools. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of about, it's about decisions, isn't it? And decisions that you make without sort of realising even that you're necessarily making decisions. And it's only in hindsight you go, that I suppose if I hadn't, you know, hadn't walked that way or gone to that party or met that person. Um, a bit like, for example, the chairs that you sat in. And I sort of made a point of saying, sit in any chair. And I presume you weren't thinking particularly about which chair you were going to sit in before you sat down. Or the choice of the cards that you picked, which again, I told you not really to think about it and just take them. And they all had a message on. Um, what was the message? What was your, what was your message? Uh, the it was a colour. It said, I will choose blue. I will choose blue. Have you yeah. any idea what that refers to? Um, blue's my favourite colour. I'm wearing a You're blue You're wearing shirt. a blue shirt? Perfect. The mini rolls are blue. It actually doesn't refer to any of those things. It refers to uh, a sheet of card that's underneath the cushion on your chair that you're, that you're sat on. And if you pull that out, you have to reach okay. under the cushion. Under the cushion. Yep. Da da da. A blue sheet of card. <laughs> and uh, what did you say, uh, Mark? Uh, I will choose green. Pull it out. And the card. And it out. <laughs> Very good. Jeremy, <laughs> just to see where this is going. Jeremy, you all said I will, I will choose, choose yellow. yellow. That's right, take it out for me. <clears throat> Which leaves you with the red. Red. Wow. Okay. Excellent. So, you see what I mean. Then they're kind of decisions that aren't important, but you make them without thinking yeah. about it. And this is kind of an area that I find interesting. And it's also the good or bad consequences that you can avoid, or things that you, you never knew would have happened had you made different decisions. And this, for me, this goes back to, and this is why the chocolates actually uh, I, I do play a role. When I was um, about 10, I was in a supermarket queue with my mum, and she bought these, not these particular ones, but uh, <laughs> any odd, I about, and uh, I was petitioning her to open them and eat them before we paid for them and she was getting a bit angry with me, a bit stressed and in her annoyance sort of ushered the lady behind us to come through ahead of us in the queue because she only had you know milk or something and then we all paid for our stuff and the woman went out, we went out, when we went out the, there was a crowd that was gathered in the car park and this woman who we'd allowed ahead of us had been hit by a car and she was laying on the, laying on the car park and um, so at the age of 10 I'm then going home thinking god if I hadn't have wanted to tuck into those mini rolls, my mum wouldn't have let mm. that woman go ahead and would it have been my mum that got hit by the car and you start to kind of do those, to do those things in your head. Um, hence the mini rolls. Would you, and, and carefully if you don't mind, would you just open them and uh, <coughs> try not to break or touch the chocolate and just sort of um, put them on the plates. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. And again, did you think about which ones you took? There were five altogether, weren't there? So you've got, Jeremy, the last one in your pocket. But otherwise than that, you just sort of grabbed. You just grabbed them. Random. <clears throat> and you presume that they are indeed mini rolls. They look like mini rolls. They do, don't they? It could be razor blades. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you just take a, take a bite out of them? <laughs> Gone. Gone. Nice big bite. <laughs> 
Nothing wrong with them. Take a bite? Nice. Jeremy, <laughs> you should take a, a larger bite. There's okay. a fish hook inside. Oh. Oh. What's that? What is that in there? What is something in there? No, 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 it's just sponge and cream. That's it. <laughs> just the way he was eating it, he made what it look like it was. Jeremy. <laughs> hey, yeah. No, that's fine, that's great. No, they, I, that's what yeah. I was hoping for. Excellent. So the last one, there was one left, you put one in your pocket, didn't you? You pull that out. Now look, um, you need to really carefully, Jeremy, just undo that. And just so we don't confuse them, just pass me your plates. Yeah. Get, yeah, really. get that out of the way. Okay. Okay, just on there. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why me? <laughs> <laughs> so look, before you do this, and do be careful, but you did just take any one. Yes. I would suggest you just take hold of the edges of it and just... Uh, Which way? Towards yeah, you? Yeah, either way, really. Just, just do be careful. Good gas. And again, I'd go a little bit further. <laughs> careful. Look. Oh, oh Jesus. Dirty. Just, um... Get out with those. It is a razor blade, is it? Uh, it is. It is. Jesus. Send it back. That wow. Is. There it is, look. Oh my yeah, that's God. what I was. I was hoping it would be the one you didn't. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on. Thank you. you Pardon, uh, pleasure. And Mark, for saving our lives. So. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's that was know. literally just pick anyone. Wasn't it, it was. There was no compulsion. There was no shenanigans. No, totally random. We walked in in a random order, chose random chocolates, sat down in random chairs. So. And also, you'd have ended up with two, and you just picked. One no, one. I could have changed my mind at the last yeah. minute. And all sealed up and then within it. How, yeah. That's the thing, how do you get, how do you get it in there? What is how that? do you get it in there? don't know. I mean, in what? It's slightly irresponsible. Darren Brown not. Bakery. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Since Richard picked the trick card, I now have license to shake up his regulated world. He's going to wake up in Marrakesh, somewhat outside his comfort zone, and this journey starts here. He's catching an early train to Waterloo, and we know he needs to get some passport photos urgently, so we're hoping he'll take the bait and step into the fake photo booth that we've set up. All the cameras are hidden. Patterns of light and sound are designed to send Richard plummeting into a catatonic state. Okay, let's get the van, let's get in there. Both Richard and our fake photo booth are embarking on an extraordinary journey. Now, I don't know how long he will remain asleep for, but for the first half hour or so, I talk gently to him to keep him in this state. We arrive at Heathrow Airport a bit late and apprehensive about the check-in. As it turns out, we get through check-in and security without a hitch, but the authorities don't allow filming after passport control. However, we do take a series of snaps throughout the journey. Any recognisable faces and logos are blurred. Richard is now sleeping very happily with no help from me.
In America's New York, I use my award-winning powers to plant a word in the slightly smaller American brain without anybody knowing how. Guys, you're free for a couple of minutes. Do you want to come and do this? Sure. It's a kind of a mind-reading okay. uh, sort of experiment. Um, I need you to call somebody that you know. Okay. All right. Uh, does your cell phone have a, a speaker phone? It does? Yes. Excellent. Good. Do you want to get someone on? Is there somebody you can call you think will be in? Right. What's this person's name? Joe. Okay. Well, if Joe isn't in, we can try someone else. Yeah. Is that on speaker at the moment? Yeah. Right, cool. Actually, if you want to hold it, if you hold it in your hand like that, then we'll both be able to hear it, and then Mike will be able to pick it up. Joe? Yeah. Okay, just stay on the line and talk to me, okay? All right. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Uh, my name's Darren Brown. I'm a, I'm a kind of English psychological illusionist, if that makes any sense. And I want to try a, a kind of a mind-reading experiment with you, all right? All right. I need to ask you a few questions, Joe. I need to know a few things about you. Please be honest. How old are you, Joe? I'm 18. 18, fantastic. <laughs> and uh, do, are you a student? Do you work? or? I'm a student. Um, what, what do you study? What, what do you, are you at school or what, what do you major in? I actually go to culinary school. Culinary school, thank you. That's really interesting. Great. All right, listen, so I'm going to write something down here. I'm not going to show uh, Jessica or any of these guys what it is. Um, I'm going to ask you to be doing three things in a moment, all right? Joe, let me just explain. You're going to be uh, writing a word in your mind on like a big chalkboard. Uh, you're going to be saying the words yourself over and over again. And then you're also going to try and do the whole thing without really thinking about it, all right? So that's three different kind of cogs that are going to be going round in your mind at the same time, all right? But let me just, uh, let me just write something here first. Okay. Okay, cool. Joe, I need you to imagine that you are, uh, you know, six years old back in elementary school, all right? And imagine you're picking up a piece of chalk. Okay. Then you're going to start writing a word very large and clear on this chalkboard, and then just tell me when you're done. All right, I'm done. You're happy that was a, a free choice of word, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Absolutely. See, I've written something here, and you won't be able to see what I've written, but hopefully you'll be able to tell by Jessica's reaction as to whether it's at all close. What was the word that you wrote? Bicycle. Bicycle. Tricycle! Oh! <laughs> yeah. It's not bad! You wrote tricycle, yeah? That was one wheel out, tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thanks for your help. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. I thought he was going to be completely wrong and it'd be like a complete sham, but then like he got tricycle. I'm pretty amazed, actually. I think you said. Like, there's no other explanation for it, because how else would you know it? <laughs> Our participant, Richard, was offered a blind choice of trick or treat. His trick started when he collapsed in a photo booth in London. Although he doesn't know it, he and that photo booth have travelled 1,429 miles and are now in Marrakesh. He has been asleep for 13 hours, but when he awakes, not a second will have passed in his mind. Whilst he was asleep, an anonymous envelope containing his passport, his return flight details and some money were placed in his pocket. After a long and bizarre journey, which for him has simply never happened, Richard is about to receive his wake-up call. All cameras are very well hidden.
Um, where am I? So, I'm about to give a demonstration of hypnosis to an audience of people who've applied to take part in my show, and I haven't prepared these people in any way. I'm going to show you from scratch how it is that I can create a hypnotic state. But what they don't know is that I'm actually on the lookout for a perfect candidate that I can program to carry out the assassination of a well-known figure at a public event. Now, nothing like this has ever been attempted before. Unless, of course, the claims of the conspiracy theorists are true. Enjoy tonight's experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what's your name? Cara. Stand up for me. Let me take your hands. Just press your palms together like that. And really press them together. And look at me right here. Then I'll just close your eyes for a second. The more you try to unlock your hands when I let go, the more you try to unstick them harder and harder, the more they keep on pressing, just like this. And the more you try now to unstick those hands, Cara, the more they keep on sticking. So what's going through your head? Let me get you a, a microphone. Thank you. Now, you're fully wide awake. Yes. You're not in some weird sort of zombie-like state or whatever people think hypnosis is. No. And they're genuinely stuck, aren't they? Yeah, when I try to move my hands, my arms are just like, no, nope, not having it, I'm sticking together and I can feel them pushing. And what's actually happening here, the idea that her hands are stuck, that I've given her, is stronger than her own sense, her own rational sense that she must be able to pull them apart. So how do you clear something like this? Once you've created it, how do you clear it? Well, there's two things. First of all, I could, I won't, but I could tell her that they're cleared. Or if something else happened that sort of took her mind off it, uh, it wouldn't actually kind of, you know, they'd probably just come apart anyway. Just take a seat for me, Kara. I just want to choose one of you at random. Just take a seat. I want to choose one of you at random. Just, ca Kara, Kara, throw this back and choose someone. They start to come apart. And there they are. <laughs> Let's move on to looking at the idea of a hypnotic trance. There, what's your name? John. John, have you come, John? Lovely to meet you. What do you do for a living, John? Um, I see. IT, excellent. Thanks ever so much for coming up. And look at me now. Look at your hand, and you just sleep. And back you go. That's good. And you can just let yourself sink right the way down, and right the way deep, and right the way sound asleep. So it looks very impressive. It's one of the most dramatic demonstrations of hypnosis to be able to hypnotize somebody like that. It's called a snap induction. What's actually happening there is I'm interrupting a, a, an automatic process for John. Shaking hands is something you don't think about. It's just this automatic process. And to interrupt somebody in the middle of something that's very automatic is very kind of confusing and bewildering for people. It's, it throws you completely. 
And at that point, you'll become highly suggestible because you want relief from the confusion. So if you induce that confusion by interrupting an automatic process and then give them a specific piece of information like sleep, not everybody, but most people will absolutely kind of embrace that. So what you've just seen might have looked dramatic, but it was achieved through nothing more than ordinary suggestion. Uh, it would be a little impractical to do this with all of you, so with the rest of you, we're going to take it a little bit more slowly. Now, under the 1952 Hypnotism Act, we cannot broadcast the complete process of hypnotic induction in case you, the audience at home, go under and can't be brought out. Close your eyes for me. But I can explain how it's done, and the key to this is relaxation and focus. I'm going to begin by creating uh, tension, so I want you to keep breathing normally, but to tense up, and then relax completely. And as you relax, you'll feel yourself just drifting down into this sleep state. Just my voice, just there in the center of your head. As you wonder just how deeply you can sink, and you can drift, and you can float, and right the way down, and right the way deep, and right the way sound asleep. Now that's all I've done. I've just got them very relaxed and focused. But the more suggestible people, when in that state, will begin to respond to my instructions. When your eyes are open, when I've counted you awake, your name will be gone from your mind. Now I know this sounds odd, I know you know me, I'm Darren, but what's your name? Try, try and remember, what is it, if you really try? I'm a million miles away. I got, like, it's just nothing coming out. Nothing coming mouth. out, no. no. So let's do this side first, take a look at me, take a deep breath in. And then just sleep right the way back down, right the way They appear down. to fall asleep because I click my fingers. In reality, the mixture of my confidence and their expectation that that's what they're supposed to do is enough for them to take it as a cue to go back under. You'll find yourself absolutely rigidly stuck into position. Have you ever been at this sort of thing done before? No. Have you been hypnotized before? Or? No, I can't move at all. First time you've done something like this? First time, yeah. And what's, what's it like? What's going on? What's it feel if like? If I push at force of one, it's like pushing back at two. These tests are helping me whittle down the number of likely candidates for tonight's experiment. Let me keep you, sir, and you. You're going to stay here as well. And finally, I've identified four people who I believe will make the most suitable potential assassins. Now we're going to examine what hypnosis can actually do. How far will people go while in a trance? Are they genuinely under some influence or just playing along? We're going to find out with the help of a classic test from the 1950s. And to help me with it is Professor Zoltan Dianas from Sussex University, a leading expert in the field of hypnosis and its impact on the subconscious. Now the question is, could we make a person do something antisocial or dangerous because we give them a hypnotic suggestion? And this is the test for that. The acid test, in fact. This chamber contains a foil-wrapped mannequin's head, over which a technician will pour highly dangerous hydrochloric acid. My four candidates are kitted out with safety gear and a beaker. I'm going to ask them to throw acid in someone's face. This exercise will show whether hypnosis can make you do things you wouldn't do if you were just playing along. If the subject is playing along, he won't throw the acid and he certainly won't carry out an assassination. Sleep. You can stand and sleep quite comfortably. Sleep. That's very good. Sleep. That's lovely. And sleep. You can stand and sleep quite comfortably. Excellent. Very good. In a little while, when you've woken up, we're going to put some hydrochloric acid in each one of those beakers. In front of you is an individual, a volunteer from the audience, we're going to call your target. And when you're awake, after a little while, uh, you will see a blue and white polka dot handkerchief. As soon as you see the polka dot handkerchief, blue with white polka dots, you will throw your beaker of acid into the face of the target stood opposite you. If that makes sense to you, I want you to nod your head if you understand that, if it makes sense. Excellent. Good. Without the candidate's knowledge, we've switched the acid for water, and they're now awoken. Eyes open, wide awake. Thank you. Lawrence, uh, if you can please take some of the acid and uh, give them each a dose in their beaker. Excellent. 
Good, excellent. So, Professor, how long have you been uh, working in this in this field for? Uh, I went to uh, Sydney in the mid '80s mm. for my masters, and uh, there was masters by research, and my research was hypnosis. So that's oh, when sorry, I... could you hang on just a, <coughs> just a second? Excuse me. Oh. Excellent. Four out of four. All four commit a highly dangerous act. Now, I only need two of them, so I've decided to continue with Alex and Chris. What happened? Uh, yeah, I just kind of instinctively did it. I, I just had the impulse to throw it in his face. The final candidates are about to be put through a challenge that could seriously affect their health. The ice plunge test, overseen by Dr. Stuart Derbyshire, Director of Pain Imaging at Birmingham University. So hypnosis can be used as a very powerful analgesic. If we tell the person the water is warm or tell them that their arm is anesthetized, they put it in the ice water and they don't feel the pain anymore. And importantly, you couldn't do this just by sort of playing along. It'd be pretty tough to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, well let's welcome our two uh, strapping volunteers. We have Chris and Alex, everybody. With the water temperature approaching freezing levels, Alex and Chris can only keep their arms in the ice bath for just under seven seconds. <laughs> Both at about the same right time. About there, yeah. What's it like? Uh, horrendous. It is very cold, isn't it? Good. Sleep and stand and sleep. Sleep. This should change once the hypnotic suggestion is planted. Completely comfortable. You had to lure your arm in. Hold it there as long as you like. You simply will not experience any sensation of cold. It'll be completely comfortable feeling, just a lukewarm room temperature sensation. Open your eyes, be wide awake. So just slowly, you can both of you just lower, lower your hand in. It's a very different feeling now, isn't it? It's like you're pushing past you know, the sort of plastic ice cubes that you can get. Now, what's it like now? How would you describe it, Alex? Um, it's like the water's not there. It's just a uh, body temperature. Yeah, what's it like for you, Chris? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Pre-hypnosis, Alex and Chris couldn't keep their hands in for more than a few seconds. This time, they stay in for two minutes. So, when I touch the side of the bath, when I grab that, the suggestion will clear. Look. Now what's it like? Oh, it's, oh, it's horrendous, horrible. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't, yeah, I don't know why I've done that to me. So, no, but the moment you're, but look, I'm holding this here, at the moment you're feeling pain, right? You are feeling pain in that arm, yeah, now, yes? But now, look, if I let go, yeah. if I let go... Quite calm. The warm sensation returns. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. it's gone back to being warm. The thermal image camera clearly shows the effect of the icy water on the two men. The dark areas on their arms indicate the temperature has dropped dramatically, while the rest of their bodies register normal heat. Right, thank you. Alex, I'm going to ask you just to pop back in your seat there for a second. Chris, I'm going to keep you up here for a little longer. Throughout the evening, I've been assessing both candidates, and I've come to the conclusion that Chris is my perfect subject. There's something of a blank slate about him, which suggests a heightened responsiveness to suggestion. Now I need to confirm that he's at the top 1% of subjects, which is what the experiment requires. Look at me. And sleep. Sleep. Just stand and sleep quite comfortably. That's good. And again, you see, it's not just about your hands and forearms. This is your entire body. The brain controls the entire body. With the water temperature plunging further, I'm going to test Chris's hypnotic responses in a way that has never been done before. I'm going to get him to immerse his whole body in the ice bath. After only 15 minutes in water this cold, Chris's vital organs will start to shut down. After 30 minutes, he could die. But if through hypnosis, Chris is able to create the false reality that the water feels warm, he won't feel the pain and will be able to stay immersed in the ice cold water. So your heart rate at the moment is about 136 BPM. Is that normal? When he first gets in, there's a shock of getting in and it would go spike. And then as he sat there, it would gradually slow down and slow down until he dies. Excellent. <laughs> to ensure his safety, a team of paramedics is standing by. So just slowly, take all the time, just so it's nice and comfy, just pop yourself down. And control the breathing, just breathe in and out, and just take your time. After one minute in the water, Chris's heart rate has dropped from 136 beats per minute to 107. At 50 BPM, the paramedics will be forced to step in.
Okay, we're going to bring you out, but before we do, what's that like at the moment? Awkward, like, like Awkward this. position, but... <laughs> but, uh... But apart from that... Yeah, it's fine. Absolutely fine. The water is now 1.4 degrees away from turning into a solid block of ice, and his heart rate has dropped to 85 BPM. He's clearly very capable of dissociating himself from the freezing temperature. The test is a success. When I grab the side of the bath, the suggestion will clear. At the moment, it's completely comfortable. And watch what happens when I touch the side of the bath. OK, I would step out. We're going to wrap you up and get you into a special thermal tank that will just bring you back to a normal temperature. Thank you so much, Chris. I think we've probably found our best subject by far this evening. Well done. This is an experiment that hasn't been done before, Chris, so you've uh, just made hypnotic history there. Well done. Chris, everybody, let's hear it for Chris. So it seems I've found my trainee assassin. But do our experts think training a killer is even possible? If we talk about the acid test just for a moment, uh, which really interested me, it looks very dramatic. Four people just throw acid in the face of other people. But of course, this isn't quite real life in this sort of situation, is it? That's exactly right. Because this is a TV studio, part of the person will infer that this is safe. What about the kind of CIA stories of programming somebody to become an assassin and go and kill somebody in real life, not in a sort of mock-up situation, but in real life? Would you expect that to happen? No, we have good reason to think that people would not do that. These are just myths. I mean, the only way you would get somebody to do that if they're already predisposed to do that. In other words, if they quite like the idea of killing somebody, then you give them permission to do it. Otherwise, if there was no sign of that, just a regular guy? No, no, you can't get a regular guy to go and kill somebody for no reason. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you both for coming along today. Excellent. Cheers. So, the academics seem pretty certain that what I'm attempting here is unachievable. Uh, and it may be, it, it really may be. The whole point of this is to find out whether or not it's, it's possible, so only, only time will tell. If this experiment is to succeed, neither Chris, a sports marketing executive, nor his family and friends can have any idea that I'm going to try and program him into becoming an assassin. As far as they're all concerned, he's simply taking part in a show that explores the limits of hypnotism. We talked to the people closest to him and slipped in some questions about violence. He's a very peace-loving person, so I can't imagine him being violent in any sort of way. I don't think Chris would do anything bad to anybody. Um, ultimately, I don't think he'd hurt a fly. Interestingly, this is what the younger brother of Bobby Kennedy's killer, Sirhan Sirhan, says about the convicted assassin's character prior to the murder. If we were sitting here and a fly happened to venture in, Sirhan would open the door, you know, and he'd try to make it go out again. It's just not conceivable to me that he would take a gun and actually use it against the person. In order to condition Chris to become an assassin, I'll be using brainwashing techniques allegedly employed by the CIA's MK Ultra program in the 1960s. There are two key stages to this process, the marksman mode and spontaneous amnesia. Eyewitness accounts report that Robert Kennedy's assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, was in a trance-like state during the shooting. Under hypnosis, the convicted killer has since said that he thought he was firing at a target in a rifle range and not at a human being. He claims a mystery woman in a polka dot dress pinched him on the shoulder to send him into this range or marksman mode. I'm going to try to create a similar mode for Chris, which will come into play if and when he attempts to assassinate his celebrity target. So I've brought him to a rifle range just outside London to meet Angie, an independent firearms instructor. So the point of today is to see how hypnosis can improve um, marksmanship and your, your, your aim. Uh, have you ever done anything like this before? Um, not really. Not really? Um, a bit paintballing. Oh, OK. Well, this is a bit of a step up. This is a lever-action rifle, such as every American child is, is, is issued with. Uh, and we are using live rounds here. Yes, we are. Because Chris has never fired live rounds before, he's getting a safety briefing and an introductory lesson in how to shoot a gun. He starts with the Winchester 38 caliber lever action rifle. Direct down. That's it. Right back there. That's it. And a nice gentle squeeze. The back of the side. Chris is slowly getting used to handling and firing the weapon. 
But it's a long way from the natural assassin I'm trying to create. Um, not very good. <laughs> On his first attempt, Chris completely misses the bullseye. You've, you've lifted the front sight mm -hmm. and it's reacted and brought the bullets higher. OK. Chris believes we're here to improve his aim through hypnosis. Just take a deep breath in and then just go back into that sleep. And you bring the gun up, a breathe in, and then a comfortable, steady breathe out. And it's on that out breath that you squeeze the trigger. His aim may improve, but more importantly, I'll also be creating the marksman mode he needs to slip into during the assassination attempt. There's a mode that you move into, and we'll call it the marksman. It's almost like a personality within you that you move into when you bring the gun up. And your unconscious mind will allow you to do that with the focus and relaxation and concentration of that experienced marksman. Next, I'll need to implant an audio trigger that once set off will automatically put Chris into marksman mode. So this is the sound. It's going to lodge itself very deeply into your unconscious. So whenever you hear that sound, whenever you hear that ringtone, your mind will shift to this marksman state. And then, as you feel it take you over, as you feel everything just moving into place and everything settling, when you're ready to give yourself that final bit of focus, you bring your finger up, you can do that now, touch yourself on the forehead, and then you become the marksman. That's very good. Will my suggestions have an effect on Chris? Now, as you do this, or maybe before you pick up the gun, I want you to trigger, trigger the state, which is your right finger on your, on your forehead, and then go into it. Remember the first time Chris completely missed the bullseye. Wow. That's brilliant. That's amazing. So you've got two right in the very centre and then one just on that outside bit and then the other two very close. That is very, very good. And you've never done this before with a real No, no, no. At all, no. That is really good, isn't it, Angie? To get groupings like this on the first time of shooting is absolutely amazing. Yeah. You've done really well. Excellent. This is uh, really, this is very, this is very impressive. I was expecting some improvement, but nothing like this. In the marksman mode I've given him, he's hit two bullseyes. Now we give Chris a different gun to make sure that his improvement isn't a fluke. What he doesn't know is that it's similar to the pistol he'll be given for the assassination. This time I use the ringtone to trigger the marksman mode. So before, the most you'd ever got was two in the centre, and that's four in the centre. Did that feel any different, doing that? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think, like, there's just a bit more concentration and um, just, yeah, kind of bring it into a bit of a focus. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't expect that result at all. There's no way, you know, he should have been able to get those groups on the first go. So whatever Darren did, I think it's absolutely amazing. In terms of the experiment, it's not important how many bullseyes Chris hits. What's vital is that he can achieve this marksman state, and to that end, the assassination programming appears to be working. I've completed the first stage of Chris's programming, the marksman mode, in which, upon hearing a specific trigger, he goes into a trance and inhabits the role of a top-level shooter. Each time he enters the marksman mode, he should believe he's back at the rifle range. I want to make sure this happens, so I brought him away from the gun range to this warehouse building to repeat the test. What was that like? Where were you? What was your experience of doing that? I found it quite easy to actually go back as if I was there um, at, the, at the range. Like a lot of my, my smells um, and the, the kind of sensation of bringing the gun up was was just like, <coughs> just like actually doing it. Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear from you. Good.
In the second part of the assassin programming process, I'm going to create gaps in Chris's memory. A form of spontaneous amnesia designed to make him forget his actions if and when he attempts the assassination. Sirhan Sirhan claims that he has no memory of killing Bobby Kennedy. I have never been able to remember what happened in that place at that time, but I have not been able to remember many things and incidents which took place in the weeks leading up to the shooting. In March 2011, he was denied parole for the 14th time because he hasn't shown enough remorse or taken full responsibility for the crime that he says he doesn't remember committing. We know with, with some degree of um, distrust, quite frankly, you're remembering parts of this and not remembering others. Do you remember the last time you had amnesia? No. It's, it's not a question, but it's uh, if you think about, for example, when you drive home, do you drive? Yeah. Yeah. So have you had that experience of driving in a car when you, you, you perhaps you're taking a familiar route home that you've taken many times and you get home and you can't quite remember yeah. taking the journey? I mean, these are quite ordinary yeah. everyday experiences, but you know that feeling. Yeah. Good. I want to show you how you can create that and also to be able to go into the trance with your eyes open. I want you to look at this pattern. And as you look at that, I want you to go into the trance, but keep your eyes open. You will have absolutely no memory of anything that occurs during the time that you're in the state. And whenever you see this polka dot design, whether it's on a screen like this or on a handkerchief or anywhere, you will move instantly and comfortably into this trance state. And then when the design is taken away from your field of vision, you come back up and out of the sleep state, just as if you were being counted awake, with no memory of what happened in between. So you can look at the screen for a bit there, and then you can stop looking at the screen. How long were you looking at the screen for? Uh, <clears throat> 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Oh, that probably is probably about right, isn't it? Actually, stand up for me. Just come and stand about there. Uh, your pin number that you use at the moment, do you use it for loads of things or is it just for getting cash out the <clears throat> machine? Mainly just, yeah, just, just my cash machine. Okay. So if I was to tell you your pin number, if I could work that out for me, you could actually, do, you could go and change that and it wouldn't be a huge deal. It's not, you're not upsetting a million other things that you use the same number for. No, not particularly, no. Okay. All right, good. So you have for me to do this if I if I can get it? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. All right. Think of your pin number. You got it? Mm -hmm. Just think of the number. And obviously you wouldn't have told anybody no. what this is. No, that wouldn't make any sense. So just think of the number. Good. That's good. Say the number. 1054. Good. Just think of it, visualize the number, imagine yourself at the machine. Look at me. One. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> yeah. One zero five four. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Is that your pin number? Yeah. Good, I was pleased I got that right. I thought I was going to get that wrong. Pin numbers are difficult. Thank you very much for today. <laughs> no problem. Excellent. It's been a fun morning. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's quite strange that he knew my pin number because I don't tell anyone. It's not like he could have asked someone who knew. Um, I haven't told him, I haven't written it down anywhere. So, I, 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 I baffled, I guess. I don't know how he, he worked it out. Chris was doing well. So after a long afternoon, it was time to unwind and have a chat. Good shoes, by the way. You always okay. seem to wear really good, really good <laughs> shoes. They're, Thank uh, you. Yeah, they're just impressive. I like shoes and very good shoes. Thank you. Um, I used to be a pickpocket when I was younger. Okay. And um, I used to steal all sorts of things from people and uh, used to take people's watches. There's a way of basically as you sort of talk to somebody and uh, take hold of their wrists and so on, you can, you can remove a watch from their, uh, from their wrist. Uh, and ties and all sorts of other things, wallets obviously. Um, and the most, um, <clears throat> the most impressive thing that I used to steal from people when I, when I was a pickpocket, only for entertainment reasons, was people's shoes. This is how I sort of got into liking shoes, I guess. And uh, would you just sort of don't, don't look at your shoes at the moment. I don't want you considering okay. too much how obviously well they're tied up and everything, but how do you think that I could just steal your shoe from you without, without you realising? 
Uh, no, not really. I, I mean, I guess somehow because it's, it's your damn round, but <laughs> no, I not really. Appreciate your faith, but it would seem impossible, wouldn't it? Because you're stood yeah. on them. A watch you can maybe imagine I could sort of move you around yeah. a bit. But, um, or what if I told you that actually I'd already stolen your shoe? <laughs> what? No. How? What's happened? Good, isn't it? Were you aware of me doing that? No. No, not at all. I don't, I don't know when that's happened. Because that was just on there a few seconds ago, wasn't it? Yeah. You've no memory of me taking that off you. You don't didn't feel anything. No, the only the last thing I can remember is when you just pointed at my shoes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that is gone. So no idea, no idea where it is. I've hidden it somewhere. Ooh. I put it in I... the I put it in the bread bin just there. <laughs> Go on, take it out. I'm very quick. It's a kind of a speed thing. But honestly, 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 you have no, you had no conception of me taking that off you. No. No, not at all. I'd put it back on. It takes a while to do the laces up. So let's back it up and see exactly what's happened there. Just sleep, just sink down into that sleep state. That's very good. When you see the polka dot design and enter that trance state, you will remove one shoe. You will put it into the bread bin. I used to be a pickpocket when I was younger. Okay. And um, I used to steal all sorts of things from people and uh, used to take people's watches. There's a way of basically, as you sort of talk to somebody and uh, take hold of their wrists and so on, you can you can remove a watch from their uh, from their wrist uh, and ties and all sorts of other things. Wallets, obviously. Um, and the most um, <clears throat> the most impressive thing that I used to steal from people when I when I was a pickpocket, only for entertainment reasons, was people's shoes. Chris is reacting perfectly to the trigger and appears capable of the amnesia required to make this experiment a success. Now that I've taken Chris through the key processes required to brainwash him into attempting a public assassination, I need a dry run to see if the experiment will work at all in real life. I'm taking Chris out to dinner, but he'll have no idea he's being filmed by cameras hidden throughout the restaurant. So what's the most, uh, what's the most sort of outrageous thing you have done? The, uh, the bungee jump was the most petrifying by a long way. I, I've done two now, but you're walking under a bridge. I hung up like just a metal grid on the bridge, under, underneath the bridge, sorry. Um, so that was much worse than the actual process of jumping. It is, it's quite strange. Everyone else here knows that something may happen and not to react if it does. This is the first true test to see if the training is working. Will he complete the task I'm about to give him? You need to open that so you can take the gun out. Now your target is the guy sat almost behind me, just to the side of the blue and white check shirt. Around your ankles and you do drop like that. Do you feel it yet? 
In order to find out whether Chris really did pull the trigger without having any knowledge of his actions, I've arranged for him to take a lie detector test, run by the UK's first polygraph examiner, Bruce Burgess. What I want to test today uh, is to see at what level that hypnosis is working at. It's important to me that, that it is genuinely really happening and that when he can't remember, he really can't remember. Right. So this is to see whether this can essentially beat a polygraph. Well, if he genuinely doesn't believe that he did it and he doesn't remember he did it, then he will come out truthful. Exactly. No question of that. If Chris lies, there will be a peak in his heart rate, his breathing will quicken, and he'll produce more sweat. These are unconscious reactions, there's no way to mask them. In order to have a baseline, the examiner will first ask a series of questions Chris has no reason to lie in response to. Is your first name Chris? Yes. When you last went shopping, did you smell custard pie in someone's face? No. Between the ages of 16 and 20, do you remember deliberately about any issues we are discussing? Do you intend to answer? Yes. Did you set up a stink bomb in the library? No. The other day when you were in a restaurant, did you shoot someone with a water pistol? No. So, you had a chance to interview Chris. What's your conclusion? Generally, I do not believe that he knows that he squirted that water pistol. I don't think he had any recollection of that at all. So if this were a case, your advice would be at this point that no, he didn't shoot a water pistol at somebody in a restaurant? That's correct. He was truthful. Writer, actor and broadcaster Stephen Fry is en route to a London venue where he'll be giving a talk to a packed house of fans. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, go on then. <laughs> I'll see you later on. Thanks very much. Two things need to be in place for this experiment to genuinely answer our question. First of all, Chris has to believe that the gun that he has in his possession is a real gun and loaded with live bullets. And secondly, he cannot know that he's being filmed. As far as Chris is concerned, this has to be a real life situation. We've told Chris we need to film with him and Stephen Fry later tonight after Stephen's talk, and we've suggested that he might as well stay and hear the talk as well. He doesn't know we're filming. I am going to head back to the office now, which is yeah, really annoying. But is it all right if I give you something to give Darren after yeah. uh, Stephen does his talk, and when you meet them on after that, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. A member of my team takes Chris into an empty dressing room prior to the show. Okay. This is really important for you to know. Yeah. This gun is loaded with three bullets. So don't touch it. Yeah. Keep it with you until you see Darren and Stephen after Stephen's finished his talk. Okay. The thing is, you have it, but whatever you do, don't lose it. Meanwhile, his celebrity target, Stephen Fry, prepares to go on stage. Wow. <laughs> Special effects experts insert fake blood packs into his jacket in case Chris does pull the trigger during his performance. A few minutes before Stephen's talk begins, Chris takes a seat in the auditorium, unaware that hidden cameras are filming his every movement. The people surrounding him, who include security guards and firearms experts, know about the experiment. But the rest of the audience is here just to see Stephen Fry and has absolutely no idea of what could happen. After 17 minutes, he'll get his first trigger. What happens afterwards will determine whether this experiment succeeds or fails. Thank you all. Good luck, everybody. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a massive warm welcome, Mr. Stephen Fry. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. How very kind. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are very, very sweet. Thank you for coming. It's incredibly kind of you to come to this. Uh, this little event. I, I wanted to talk about an enthusiasm um, that has consumed me without me knowing it almost all my life. You'll understand why I say almost when I tell you about it. Um, what I'm obviously thinking of is language. A few evolutionary things were necessary for mankind to speak language, but once we had language, then everything else followed. It is absolutely the spring of all we are. In our culture, we keep certain words in, in a special place in our brain. But I remember going to the Takana people in northern Kenya. Kenya alone has 69 languages. And the Takana people 
speak one which is related to only one of the other 69, the Nilo Hamitic language. It's, it's a beautiful language, it's rich, it's like English, it's full of... Oh, there's always one, isn't there? God bless her. Thank you. Well done. Amazing ideas, and brilliant concepts, but, 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 but it's been swamped. It's been swamped by Swahili. That's the problem, you see. These other languages like Swahili are swamping Africa, just as English is swamping Europe and the world and the internet, and Mandarin Chinese is swamping the Orient. No one really understands how to save a language or whether a language is worth saving. France, for example, has the language of Oxford. The is Stephen Fry. And the French have absolutely no interest, the rest of France, in saving it. Indeed, I went to visit the Academy Francaise, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is a very extraordinary institution. The Academy of Francaise is for these ancient people who are, who are you know, great minds and thinkers, and they decide which words are allowed into the French language, which words are permissible, which words you might like, say are forbidden, and which words are not forbidden. So they also make words up. Corviel, they decided, would be the word for email. They were not going to have le email or l'email. Ordinateur, they decided, would be a computer, an ordinateur. And so they made up you know, words that were not allowed to enter the French language, which is, let's be honest, it's but it's pissing into the wind. <laughs> you can't, you can't. Happy get? Oh, good. Well done. Phew. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. Cool. You're going to change your jacket. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just explain what's uh, what's going on here. This is the culmination of quite a few months' work. There is See whether this it's gentleman called Chris, who's currently in a hypnotic trance. See whether it's possible to hypnotically program a person to kill Chris, as far as he's concerned, just carried out a real assassination. Stephen was in on that, and there was no danger at all. Here he is, Stephen, everybody. Hey, Patrick. Hey, hey. I'm talking to you now, Chris. So I'm now going to count you away. Three, two, one. The Kana is just one example, as I said, 69 Kenyan languages. One thing of language is a kind of tragedy. In the end, what I want to concentrate on more than anything else is language as a source of pride and beauty. All of you have language in your head. I hope you go out into the world a little more amazed. Anything strange happened during the talk? No, no. I'm going to show you some footage of something that did happen. We actually had a camera on you. I know we didn't let you know that we were filming, which was important. Do you remember that woman in the polka dot dress? No. Don't remember her turning around talking to you? No. Remember that bit? No. Yes, at the moment you will have no memory of this at all, but you just assassinated a national treasure. <laughs> yeah, you shot me. Okay, so look, you know when you have a dream and you have no memory of it, and then somebody says something that just kind of triggers it, and then bit by bit it just starts to come back. And if you do think about it now, just start to think back for me. It's just like a mental block that you have there at the moment. And you can just start to let that go, and you can start to let it... What's coming back to you? <laughs> I, can't, I remember the, the poker, that woman coming in there. And yeah, just kind of picking the gun up from the side, like, like I was told. It, Where did you think you were? Nowhere. <laughs> but it, like, if anywhere, it was closest to the, like, the range, because I, mean, I could visualise the, the lights going down and the, and the target. 
and picking up felt like I was picking off that bench. Did you feel anything when you were no. aiming a loaded, <laughs> a loaded gun at Stephen? Not really. No, no. Just felt like the kind of the outline of the target. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It was like a dream that you could really visualise, but it's a dream which is so far-fetched you know it not to be true. So you will not be responding anymore to the polka dot design that you did.